Faith Publication presents the story of one man who stood in the face of oppression and tyranny. The story of one man, one scholar, one imam. Mu'tasim came in to his court and he sat on his chair and he took off his shoes and he put one leg over the other and he told the guards, Uhduru Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Bring Ahmad ibn Hanbal in front of me. He said that I was in shackles and the shackles were heavier than my and own. And Imam body. Ahmad was struggling with his chains. He could hardly walk. He said, Innaka ra'san nas al Today, you are the leader of all the people. This is the story of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, presented to you by Sheikh Safi Khan in a series titled Profiles of Courage. Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'ghfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina Man yahdi allahu fala mughalla lah wa man yudlil fala hadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika lah وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله فإنه لا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا أما بعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا أو oh, يبليذ fear Allah and say that which is right brothers and sisters we've talked about the issue of oppression so much and so often because it's around us. And in the midst of oppression, it is crucial, it is critical for us to remember whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and how we can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the power of dua. The situation may seem bleak, but with dua, there's hope. About 1200 years ago, a little bit more than 1200 years ago, there was a powerful event that happened in the history of mankind. In the history of this ummah, in the history of mankind. This event pitted a very powerful tyrant who had all the means of torture and persecution at his disposal. Pitted against a weak bodied man who had a heart that was a mountain of faith, mountain of Iman. It was an event that left a picture, a clear picture, of how faith triumphs over falsehood. How Iman dispels injustice. How Taqwa trashes tyranny. And how patience outlasts the plots and the schemes of the enemy. It was an event where there was a strong-willed believer who stood up against an institution, a system 
that was out to silence him. And despite the threats, the persecution, the assassinations, and all the various techniques that those hostile to Islam use, he stood up strong. This is the story of a man who stood up tall when others around him crumbled into compromise and capitulation. It's the story of a young man who memorized the Qur'an before he turned 10. It's the story of a man who was a virtual human computer. Part of the storage in his computer brain were one million hadith that he had memorized. It was a man who regularly saw a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his dream at night. In his dreams at night. He would regularly see a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on the nights he would not see him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would knock himself for being a hypocrite. The name of this giant in this ummah is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Brothers and sisters, at the time of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, a band of Muslims known as the Mu'tazila had begun to have some strange ideas, strange views about the Qur'an. Something that no one else among our pious predecessors ever had before. And the Mu'tazila were famous for using their mind to rationalize and reason out everything. Everything had to make sense to their brain. If it made sense, then they would believe it. If it didn't make sense, then they would say, forget it, we don't believe it. Of course, it sounds familiar to many people today. So, because of rationalizing everything, they came to a conclusion of not believing in some of the, or many of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like most of us believe, like a normal Muslim would believe. We believe in all the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as given to us in the Qur'an and the Sunnah of His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Mu'tazila did not believe in these names, these attributes. And then what happened is that to many of us, this may appear like a minor issue. We may think, oh, well, what's the big deal? You know, there's a lot more important things happening. Well, actually, it's a pretty major issue. Because the, the thing is that if they denied certain names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that meant that they were denying something that was in the Qur'an and the sunnah of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because it did not make sense to their mind. They could not rationalize it, they could not reason it out. In other words, what they were doing is they were doing something totally opposite to the spirit of Islam, which is to put mind before the message, which is to put reason before revelation, is to put, as, they, as we say in the Islamic terminology, to put the aql before the naql. Of course, in Islam, revelation comes first. We use our mind to understand the revelation and to reason and to understand, not to undermine the revelation. So the way that the Mu'tazila looked at this issue was that in particular in one issue, they did not believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can speak. Because they, their line of reasoning, which was totally flawed, their line of reasoning was that look, Speaking is something that human beings do. So since human beings speak, and we know already that nothing is like Allah, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There's nothing like Allah. So therefore, since human beings speak, and nothing is like Allah, so Allah does not speak. This is their line of reasoning. Because only human beings speak. So Allah cannot speak. And therefore, the Qur'an is not Allah's speech, but it's something that Allah created. Now, as I said again, to many of us it may seem something minor. 
But the major issue here is that they're using their mind, their reason before the revelation. So on the surface, it may appear, well, that's, it's not such a big deal, it's okay. But when you understand that somebody is worshipping their mind, and somebody is putting my, their mind ahead of the message, and the reason before the revelation, and the aql before the naql, then you understand that there's something very wrong with this type of reasoning. And our the correct Muslim belief is that we believe in all the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as has been documented in the Qur'an and the sunnah of His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything beyond that, outside of the scope of the Qur'an and the sunnah, we don't believe in. As Muslims, we believe that if Allah speaks, yes, indeed He speaks. But His speech is not like our speech. But He does speak. If Allah sees, and Allah does see, His sight is not like our sight. If Allah, and Allah hears, when Allah hears, His hearing is not like our hearing. When Allah has hands, they're not like the hand, like our hands. If Allah has fingers, which He does, Allah's fingers are not like our fingers. Allah has a face, but His face is not like our face. But He does have a face. He does have fingers. He does have hands. So, now, these people, they, the Mu'tazila, they said, forget it. This doesn't make sense. How can it be possible? You're making Allah look like human beings. It's not possible. And they said, forget it. We, we, don't, we don't believe in this and this is nonsense. So this line of reasoning, this, this mode of thought, began to gradually take hold of many of the regular everyday Muslim. They began, because they began to broadcast this and they began to talk about this all over the place. And so many Muslims who did not know much about the Qur'an and the Sunnah, they began to buy into this. To such a degree that it began to have an impact on the leadership of the Ummah. The Amir al-Mu'mineen. At that time, the Khalifa whose name was Ma'moon. And Ma'moon, mind you, he was no pushover. He was very knowledgeable about the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And he knew a lot of fiqh. And he was well read. His, his, uh, he, he, he was very prolific in his Arabic. So he was no pushover. So it affected him also. And he began to believe in this way of thinking. That the Qur'an was created. It was not the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how he began to believe. Of course it's a wrong belief. But he began to believe like so. And the problem that happened is, not only did he begin to believe that, and he believed it, but he began to persecute all those people who did not hold his view. He began to kill them. He began to murder them. Began to imprison them. Began to persecute them. So, in this process, there were many scholars who succumbed to the, the pressure and the threats of persecution. And they gave in. But there was those who stood strong. And among those who, those people who stood strong and said, no, the Qur'an is the, is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kalam Allah. And the, the Qur'an is what Allah spoke, it is not created, it is, it is uncreated. Those who stood up for the official Islamic position, the right Islamic position, they were beaten, they were whipped, they were starved, they were imprisoned, or shall I say caged. They were blindfolded, they were shackled. They were tortured, physically and psychologically. And they were killed and assassinated. You see, the Khalifa at that time, Ma'moon, he sent orders from Syria to Baghdad to his chief of police, whose name was Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. And he sent him uh, some directives that go ahead and interrogate all these people, and especially the scholars, who don't believe in the way that I'm saying things, that the Qur'an was created. Begin to interrogate them. So, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim immediately began the interrogations, began to call up the ulama, the scholars, and began to talk to them. What do you think about what the, what the Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying? What do you think? What do you think? Is the Qur'an created? Is it not created? And so on. And many of the scholars 
they began to crumble. They began to give up and they began to, they began to say that yes, if, uh, you know, there were three groups of scholars. Some said yes, the Quran is created. Another group of scholars, they took a middle, they tried to take what they thought was the middle path. And they said that look, the Quran is not created. However, if the Amir tells us, then we'll say it's created. And the last group, which were very few, a handful, they said no, the Quran is not created. It is the word of Allah uncreated. So, as Ishaq ibn Ibrahim began interrogating the scholars, now came the turn of the giant of this ummah, one of the giants of this ummah, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. He summoned Imam Ahmad bin Ibn Hanbal and began asking him. And he said to him, مَا تَقُولْ فِي مَا, ما تَقُولْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ He said. Well, what do you have to say about the Qur'an? So, Imam Ahmad said, هُوَ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ This is the word of Allah. This is the speech of Allah. And so, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, he said, a مَخْلُوقٌ huwa. Is this Qur'an created? Imam Ahmad said, هُوَ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ لَا أَزِيدُ عَلَيْهِ It's the word of Allah. And I'm not going to say anything more. This is the courage of the believer. Fears no one but Allah. And so, he said, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, the police chief, he says, what do you have to say about this, what the Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying? The statement that he made, and the statement that, uh, that uh, Mu'mun made, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah la yushbihuhu shay'i, لا في وجه من الوجوه وفي معنى من المعاني. He said, what do you have to say about this statement? The translation of that statement is that Mu'mun, he said, I bear witness that there is no one who deserves to be worshipped but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and that nothing is like him in any way or in any meaning. Nothing is like Allah. Because he thought Mu'mun was trying to trap the scholars, because the minute they would say that Allah speaks, they would say, okay, this is like a human being. So they're making something like Allah. So, so you know, you have to kill them. So, Ishaq said, what do you have to say about the statement? Imam Ahmad said, أَقُولُ كَمَا قَالَ Allah." He said, I, I say like Allah says. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ He quoted a part of a verse from the Qur'an. And he said, there's nothing like Allah. And he is... The most hearing and, and the most the most seeing. So, one of the people who was sitting there, one of the other police officers who was sitting there, he said, you know what he means by this, what he's saying? He's saying that Allah hears through an ear like our ear, and Allah sees like through, uh, through, his, through eyes like our eyes. So, Ishaq turned to Imam Ahmed and said, what do you mean by وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ Basir? What do you mean when Allah says that He is the most hearing and the most seeing? What do you mean by this? So Imam Ahmad said, هُوَ كَمَا وَصَفَ نَفْسَهِ That Allah is like He's described Himself. That's exactly what we say. Like exactly how He's described Himself and how He's told us about Himself, that's what we say. So he said, but, but how? How is Allah like this? How? I mean, he's trying to get Imam Ahmad to speak more than what's necessary. So Imam Ahmad said that we, we believe in whatever Allah has specified and whatever Allah has established in the Qur'an and whatever His Prophet ﷺ has established in the Sunnah, this is what we believe in. So he saw automatically that he could not break Imam Ahmad. So he turned and he wrote, he went to his, back to his office and he wrote his report to Ma'mun. After nine days, the leader, the Amir al-Mu'mineen's reply came back. And needless to say, the Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ma'mun, he was very upset. He was livid. And he began accusing the believers, like these scholars, like Imam Ahmad, of being kafirs, of innovation, of committing shirk, of being hypocrites. And he began calling them all sorts of names. And at the same time, he sent a threat for all these scholars who were standing up to the truth, and he said that, look, they better 
they better retract their, their views and they better drop their position and they be given an opportunity to do, to do tawbah, to repent. And if they don't, then all of them should be gathered, all of them should be imprisoned, and all of them should be brought to me, and I'll deal with them. And so the same message went out for Imam Ahmad. And soon, all the scholars, all the ulama, who stood up for what was right, that the Qur'an is a speech of Allah, they were rounded up, they were shackled, they were taken to prison, and they were marched to Syria. From Baghdad, they were marched to Syria. To the court of Ma'moon. And this fitna, this trouble began to spread all over the Muslim world. And scholars from Egypt and from the Hijaz, and from what we know now in, in, in Saudi Arabia, and all over the Muslim lands, anybody who said that the Qur'an is a speech of Allah, they began to be arrested, and they began to be taken in, and they began to be tortured and persecuted, and they were brought to the court of Ma'moon. In Baghdad, in those days, this is roughly around the year 218, uh, after the Hijrah. In Baghdad, there were roughly 26 scholars who had held pretty strong. But after torture and persecution and so on, 17 of them, they gave in. And so this left about 9 of them. Out of the nine, seven of them were tortured so bad that they eventually were killed or they passed away under torture. Two of them remained. Those two were Imam Ahmad and his student Muhammad ibn Nuh. Rahimahumullah. Imam Ahmad relates that now these two were taken from Baghdad to Syria. On the way to Syria, he says that we made various stops along the way for rest. He said that I was in shackles, and the shackles were heavier than my own body. And we were dragging ourselves, you know, walking, and being said, sometimes we were put on, on these mules, going towards the Khalifa in Syria. He says on the way we stopped at this one place, and when we stopped at this one place, there was a man who came to both of us, meaning himself and his student, Muhammad ibn Nuh. And he said, Ayyukum Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Who, this was a man who came from the desert, a regular everyday Muslim. And so he said, who among you, who of you is Imam, uh, who of you is Ahmad ibn Hanbal? So the people who were there, the guards and Muhammad ibn Nuh, they pointed to Imam Ahmad and said, this is the person. So the person looked into his eyes and he said, Assalamu alaikum. Ya Imam. He said, Innaka wafidun nas. Fala takun shu'man alayhim. He said, Oh Imam, look, you are the ambassador or the envoy of the people. And so don't become bad news for them. Don't become a calamity for the people. In other words, what he was telling him, stand up strong. He said, Innaka ra'san nasi yawm Today, you are the leader of all the people. He said to Imam Ahmad. Fa'iyaka an tujibahum إِلَى مَا يَدْعُونَكَ إِلَيْهِ فَيُجِيبُ النَّاسِ فَتَحْمِلُ أَوْزَارَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He said, don't you dare acquiesce or respond to what they're calling you to do. Don't you dare agree to them because then all the masses of Muslims, they will also begin to agree. All of us are looking up to you. So don't you dare give in. Otherwise, everybody else will give in. And then you will carry their sins on the day of judgment. Because you slip, so everyone else is going to slip. So, and then he went on and he said, In kunta tuhibbu Allah, if you really love Allah, if you really love Allah, 
فَصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِ Be patient in the situation that you find yourself in. فَإِنَّهُ مَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا أَنْ تُقْتَلْ فَإِنَّهُ مَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا أَنْ تُقْتَلْ He said, because, listen, the only thing that stands between you and paradise is for you to be killed, for you to be executed. وَإِن لَمْ تُقْتَلْ تَمُتْ And if you are not assassinated, if you're not executed, then you're going to eventually die. وَإِن عِشْتْ And if you happen to survive, if you happen to live, عِشْتْ حَمِيدًا You'll live a very praiseworthy, a very honorable life. People will all praise you. Imam Ahmad says, when he heard this person speak, right after he spoke, he said, "Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh." And he left. He turned around and left, went back into the desert. So Imam Ahmad began asking, "Who was this person?" And it was told to him that this was a Bedouin who had come out of the desert, but he he was also a poet, and his name was Jabir ibn Amr. And so Imam Ahmad says that what this person said helped me to increase my determination and made me ever more determined to refuse to capitulate to what they were calling me to, to refuse to, to refuse to do what they were telling me to do. It made me that much stronger. Brothers and sisters, a few words here and there by someone can have a powerful impact in our lives. Brothers and sisters, this man came and he was trying to strengthen Imam Ahmed trying to give him some strength, trying to tell him to hold strong. And today, brothers and sisters, the same message goes out to all of you. To hold strong in the midst of all the problems, in the midst of all the oppression. To hold strong. To hold very, very strong. Because paradise is very near. And not to give up the things that you're doing as far as being a Muslim. To hold on and keep practicing your Islam and become ever more stronger. The more the oppression increases, the stronger you get in your Islam. This is what the man was telling him. That look, you today are the leader. You today represent the truth. And in the same way, all of you who participate regularly in the masjid, you today represent the truth. And there's a lot of people who are looking at you to see how you're going to do when it comes to the truth. Those of you who have various ayat of the Qur'an memorized, those of you who have some Islamic knowledge, those of you who have been fortunate to memorize the Qur'an, those of you who are going to an Islamic school, the, all of those things, other people outside are looking at you to see how you are going to fare under this pressure. Are you going to hold strong? Because they're looking to you to be inspired. Whether you know it or not. And if you give up, they're going to give up. Imam Ahmed later on, one of the famous statements that he made, and we'll talk about it later, he said, as he was being tortured, they were telling him to give up a little bit, and to go easy, and to compromise. And he said, Zallatul Alim, Zallatul Alam. He said, look, the fall of the scholar means the fall of the community. Means the fall of the people. If I slip, the community will slip. That was his point. So brothers and sisters, today is an important opportunity for us to stand strong in what we believe in. Like Imam Ahmad stood strong at that time. أَقُولُ قَوْلِي هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين brothers and sisters you know after they made this stop they renewed their journey on the way to Syria and as they as they got near the palace of the Khalifa Right outside the palace, hardly a few yards away, there was another stop, the last, the last stop that they made. To take, just to gather everything and to rest, just for a little bit, before proceeding into the palace. 
as they were sitting there, Imam Ahmad and Muhammad ibn Nuh, and all the huge number of guards all around them, and they were shackled. Imam Ahmad says that one of the servants of the Khalifa, Ma'moon, came rushing out to Imam Ahmad and said, Ya Izzu Alayya Ya Aba Abdullah. He said, Look, Abu Abdullah was, you know, was his kunya and one of his, you can say, surnames. And he said that, Look, this is very difficult for me to see you in this position. I can't bear it. And he was crying. He was crying and crying and, and sobbing. He was wiping his tears away with, the, with, with his sleeve. And so Imam Ahmed, although he was shackled, he grabbed him on one arm and he tried to lift him up as if to, to give him strength. And so the man said, Inna al-ma'moon salla sayfan Ma'moon has taken out his sword. Lam yasullahu qabla dhalik. He has taken out his sword in a way that he's never done before. In other words, he is very serious this time. وَإِنَّهُ لَا يُقْسِمُ بِقَرَابَتِهِ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ And he swears that what he's doing is right and he swears because of his closeness to the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Because you see, Ma'moon came from a family of the Abbasis and they were related to one of the uncles of the Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم, Abbas. So there's where the connection is. So he said that he is swearing by his closeness by being part of the family of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. لَإِن لَمْ تُجِبْهُ إِلَى الْقَوْلِ بِخَلْقِ الْقُرْآنِ لَيَقْتُلَنَّكَ بِذَلِكَ السَّيْءِ he said that if you don't respond and come out and say that the Qur'an was created, he's going to kill you for sure this time with his sword. Imam Ahmad, he heard what was said, he smiled, and he acknowledged that he understood what was coming. And the servant left and went back to the palace. Imam Ahmed got up to make two rak'ahs. As he got up to pray, in his, he began the salah, and in the salah, he began making dua in the sajda and so on. At the very end of the salah, he prayed a qunut, and before Coming into the last sajda, the second rak'ah, he raised up his hands in the air and he said, and he made a dua. He said, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Qad gharra hilmuka hadha al-fajr. He said, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, Your clemency, meaning that you've let him, this person go for so long, Your clemency, has made this rebellious person, this, this sinner, this evil sinner, so proud, so arrogant. Meaning that, because you haven't punished him, O oh Allah, this person has become so arrogant. So your clemency, your letting him go for this time, has made this person very arrogant. حَتَّى تَجَرَّ عَلَىٰ أولئك and he has become so bold and daring that he has now begun to transgress all bounds against these people, meaning the scholars, بِالضَّرْبِ وَالْقَتِلْ by, by, by whipping them and beating them and by killing them. He's gone beyond all bounds. And then he said, Allahumma, O oh Allah, فَإِنْ كَانَ الْقُرْآنِ كَلَامَكْ غَيْرَ مَخْلُوقِ فَكْفِنَا مَأُونَتَهِ In another narration, فَكْفِنَا شَرَّحِ He said that, Oh Allah, if this Qur'an is your speech, uncreated, then take all his evil 
and all the troubles of this person, take it away from us. And with that, he went into sajda, and he was coming to the end of his salah. After he said the salams, he sat back, reflecting. He had hardly finished his salah when they heard loud noises from outside. Loud like, sh- like shouts and shrieks from inside the palace. And from outside the palace, there was people wailing. And so the prisoners, Imam Ahmad and Muhammad ibn Nuh, they, they asked, what happened? Why all this noise? Why all this, why all these people shrieking and shouting and people wailing? And then what was told to them was that Ma'mun just died. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Talk about connections. Talk about knowing someone powerful. Talking about having contacts in high places. Subhanallah. No sooner had Imam Ahmad made his dua and ended his salah, completed his salah, that the orders from atop the seven heavens, from atop the throne came, and the angel of death descended and plucked out the soul of Ma'mun, and the rest is history. Brothers and sisters, this was Iman. This was faith in action. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Innama yansurullahu hadhi al-ummah bidha'ifiha. Surely Allah will make this ummah victorious by the virtue of its weak. What are the nuclear weapons they have? Bidha'watihim wa salatihim wa ikhlasihim. By virtue of their du'as, by virtue of their salah, and by virtue of their ikhlas, their sincerity of commitment to Allah. These are the weapons they possess. Dua, salah, and sincerity. Brothers and sisters, to some, our situation may appear bleak. It appears that many of our hopes are dashed when people are um, in our ummah are assassinated or imprisoned. It may seem that many of our dreams are shattered. And sometimes it may appear that the horizons of justice are clouded by the overcast skies of injustice. And by the tornadoes of tyranny. And the smoke of oppression. But no one thing. No one thing and one thing alone. That the sun of iman and taqwa is about ready to break forth and dispel the darkness of falsehood with the light of the truth. Brothers and sisters, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us in these situations so we will turn to no one and no one but Allah and so that we have no choice but to say at the end of the day, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, I need your help, oh Allah, Ya Allah. And to yell, and, and, to, and, to, and to have our souls yearn with this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never underestimate the power of dua. Never underestimate the power of dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُطَّرِ إِذَا دَعَى وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ وَيَجْعَلُكُمْ خُلَفَاءَ الْأَرْضِ أَإِلَاهٌ مَعَ اللَّهِ قَلِيلًا قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ أَمَّنْ يَهْدِيكُمْ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ That who is there besides Allah who answers to the dua of the one who's oppressed when they make the dua? In other words, no one but Allah. And who is there but Allah to, to, to take away the evil that is there? And to make you all his representatives on this earth, the representatives of this deen on this earth, and to give you authority. <laughs> Is there anyone but Allah who deserves to be worshipped? <laughs> but very few of you remember. Very, very few of you think and reflect on this. Never underestimate the power of the dua. 
Brothers and sisters, many of us don't realize, or perhaps most of us don't realize, that you, as Muslims, possess the most powerful and the most potent weapon available to any human being. It is more powerful than the bullet and the missile and the bomb. It's called dua. Dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Inna lanansuru rusulana walladhina amanu fil hayati dunya. We will make our prophets, our messengers, and those who believe victorious in this world, in the life of this world. كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرًا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ That how, haven't you seen how many small groups of people overcame a huge amount of people by the permission of Allah, and Allah surely is with those people who are patient. كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَأَغْلِبَنَّ أَنَا وَرُسُلِي إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ Allah has decreed that He will come with the victory and His prophets. Surely Allah is most powerful and most mighty. Allah will surely help those who help His cause. In Allah laqawiyun aziz. Surely Allah is the most powerful and the most mighty. This is what Allah is telling you. In yansurkum Allah fala ghalib lakum. If Allah was to help you, no one can overcome you. No one can defeat you. No one can overwhelm you. If you have Allah's help, and you will get it through dua. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, I remind you, indeed, the times are tough. But you must stand strong. You must refuse to buckle under the pressure of oppression. Hold on to the hijab and don't take it off. Hold on to your marriages and don't go apart from each other. Come more to the masjid. Associate more with the Muslims. Give more. Volunteer more for the sake of Allah. Be patient. Sacrifice. Be caring for each other. Bear with each other's weaknesses and shortcomings for the sake of Allah. Imam Ahmad did. He stood strong. And his story is not over. We will talk more about him in, in the future. But he stood strong. And he was advised that the people are looking at him, so be strong. Similarly, you have a responsibility today to be strong and hold on and be steadfast. And don't give in and don't give up. Innama yansurullahu hadihi al-umma bidha'ifiha. Surely Allah will make this ummah victorious by the virtue of its weak. Bidha'ifiha. By the virtue of their du'as, bidha'watihim. And by virtue of their prayers, wa salatihim. And by virtue of their sincerity, wa ikhlasihim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasanatan wa qina azab al-nar. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله فإنه لا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا أما بعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا أو oh, you believe fear Allah and say that which is right say that which is proper brothers and sisters last time when we met we were traveling with Imam Ahmed 
and his student Muhammad ibn Nuh as they were traveling to go to Ma'mun, the Khalifa at that time. And as we begin to travel with them again, I just wanted to remind all of us that as we travel with them, reflect on the profiles of courage that come out from their character. And certainly these profiles of courage are applicable to our lives today. Because many of us, many of us, if not most of us, we are beginning to cower in the presence of the pressure that has been foisted upon us to practice our Islam. Many of us are shy to go out and shy to speak about Islam. Many of us don't want to be noticed as Muslims. And many of us, as they say, are trying to pull back, are trying to just be conservative as they say, and not to do, and not to make any waves, so to speak. But in the midst of all of this, the believer steps up to the plate and is ready for action. And is ready to talk openly and to speak with courage and to act with courage. During the times of trial and tribulation, it is time to step up. It is time to get more active and to become more dynamic. It is not the time to pull back and say, that, let me wait till the storm passes and then I'll come out from my suburbs or I'll come out from my closet. No. This is not the way the believer behaves. So we're traveling with Imam Ahmed. And Imam Ahmed and his student Muhammad ibn Nuh, as they are led to Ma'mun, on the way they stop. And when they stop, Imam Ahmed makes a dua. And he makes the salah and he makes his dua. Remembering that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, إِنَّمَا يَنْصُرُ اللَّهُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّ بِضَعِيفِهَا Surely Allah will make this ummah victorious by the virtue of its weak. بِدَعْوَتِهِمْ وَصَلَاتِهِمْ وَإِخْلَاصِهِمْ By virtue of their duas, by virtue of their salah, and by virtue of their sincerity. Th three things that Imam Ahmad had. And the dua was a very powerful dua as all of you know. This dua changed the commander-in-chief. This dua changed the entire political situation at that time. They didn't need elections. They just needed a dua from a sincere heart. A heart that was devoted to Allah. It was a dua that sent the Khalifa to, to the next world, to the hereafter. It was a dua that rid humanity of a despotic ruler, of an oppressor. So after Ma'mun passed away, the security forces of Ma'mun, they were kind of confused. They didn't know what to do with Imam Ahmad and Muhammad ibn Nuh. So they talked about it among themselves and they decided, well, we'll take him back to this prison they call Ruqa' and we'll take him back there. So they started marching back to another prison that they had passed on the way, which was named Ruqa'. And as they were going, as they were going to this prison, Muhammad ibn Nuh, the student of Imam Ahmad, he fell sick. And he began to feel so sick that he felt as if the onset of death was very near, as if he's going to die very soon. So they stopped in a place to see if he would recover. And as everybody was waiting around Muhammad ibn Nuh, he was so tired that he was lying down. And he beckoned to Imam Ahmad to come near him. And Imam Ahmad came near him and he said to Imam Ahmad, he whispered in his ears, and he said, and Imam, Imam Ahmad was also in chains. Muhammad ibn Nuh, despite the fact that he was sick, they did not let him out of his chains. He could hardly move, but he still had chains all over his body. His hands, his feet, all over his body. Just like Imam Ahmad. 
So Imam Ahmad had trouble bending down because of the weight of the chains. He was afraid he would fall. But nevertheless, he bent down on his knees to come close to Muhammad ibn Nuh. And Muhammad ibn Nuh whispered into the ear of Imam Ahmad and he said, Ya Aba Abdullah, Allah, Allah, innaka lasta misli, innaka lasta mithli, anta rajulun yuqtada bik. He said, Oh Abu Abdullah, it was a name of Imam Ahmad. He said, Oh Abu Abdullah, Allah, Allah, I'm asking from Allah and I'm asking from Allah and I swear by Allah and Allah, think of Allah. إنك لست مثلي you are not like me أنت رجل يقتدى بك that you are a man whom people emulate who people are looking up to for leadership قد مد الخلق أعناقهم إليك لما يكون منك all of creation all all people have extended their necks just to see what you're going to do and what's going to come from you فاتق الله واثبت لأمر الله he says, so fear Allah and be firm for the sake of Allah, for the decree of Allah. Be firm. This is what he whispered into the ears of Imam Ahmed. And Imam Ahmed says, فَعَجِبْتُ He says, I was very surprised, I was pleasantly surprised at the way he talked to me. He says, and I was pleasantly surprised at the way that he warned me. And the way that he told me, how he told me. He says then, Imam Ahmad relates, he says then, the people were so merciless, the guards, that they kept on insisting that we move. And he could hardly move, but they kept on insisting. And we, so we started moving. And soon, Muhammad ibn Nuh, he fell dead. He died as they were moving. Imam Ahmad says that they stopped and he washed his body, he put him in the coffin and he buried him. And he made, he made the salah and then he buried him. After this they resumed their journey. And eventually Imam Ahmad was the only one who made it to a prison in northern Iraq before Baghdad. He says, when we got to the prison, they put me in and as I was going in, he says, I was saying the words of Yusuf alayhi salam, رَبِّ السِّجْنُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا يَدْعُونَنِي إِلَيْهِ That my Lord, this prison, this jail cell, is much more beloved to me than what they're calling me to do. That is to leave Islam and to, and to say something that is against Islam. My Lord, this prison cell, this jail cell is better for me, and is more beloved to me than, than doing, you know, saying that which is not right. So, he says that, as I went in, they left me shackled. And for a couple of nights, they, they didn't bother. And he says, I was saying to myself, As-sijnu kurh, wal-qaydu kurh, wal-darbu kurh, wal-wa'idu kurh, walakinnahu fi sabili Allahi hayy. He said that I know that prison is very bad, it's very distasteful, very hateful. And I know that being in the shackles and the chains that I'm in is very hateful. And I know that being whipped is very hateful, something that no one likes. And I know that getting all these threats against me and the punishment and all of this, this is bad. And it's very hateful. But for the sake of Allah, all this is easy. All this is okay. His grandson came up to Imam Ahmad and he told him, look, how are you going to pray? You're on all these shackles and the chains are on you and they're not letting you go. How are you going to pray? Why don't you just let the prayer go? I mean, how, how are you going to pray? And you just possibly having all these chains, you can't, when you sit down in the last rak'ah, you, you can't, you, you can't sit down properly like the way Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to sit down. So how are you gonna sit? How are you gonna pray? So Imam Ahmad, with total confidence in Allah, 
with total calmness, responded and he said, كَيْفَ مَا تَيَسَّرَ وَأَطَاقَ A person can pray however easy it is for that person and whatever that person can do. He says, فَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ He said, and I praise Allah for all His help and all the blessings that He sent my way. Where is Imam Ahmad saying this? In prison while he's in shackles. He's saying, Alhamdulillah for all the good that Allah has done for me. And subhanallah, and glory be to Allah for in the manners that he tests his servants with. The trials that he tests his servants with. Glory be to Allah. This is Imam Ahmad. A profile of courage. He feared no one but Allah. It's as if he was saying, I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim and I do not walk alone. I fear no one except the one above that throne. Brothers and sisters, when he was in prison, Imam Ahmad, they took him and they put him in the general section where the general population of the inmates was. So, one day, he asked for some water. So the prison guards brought him some water. And along with the water, they brought him ice. So he was surprised. So he said to the people, that uh, the, the prison guards, that he didn't want the water. So the, they, they were surprised. At first he wanted it, now he doesn't want it, and he put it aside. So they, they said to him, Lima la tashrab? Why don't you want to drink this water? He said, هَلْ عِنْدَكْ مَاءٌ وَثَلْجٌ يَكْفِينِي وَمَنْ مَعِيَ فِي السِّجْنِ He said that, do you have water and ice for me and for everyone else here in the prison? They said, لا. No, of course not. He said, كَيْفَ أَشْرَبُ مَاءً بِثَلْجٍ وَمَنْ مَعِيَ فِي السِّجْنِ لَا يَشْرَبُونَ he says, how can I drink water with ice and everybody who's around me in this prison is not going to drink? This is character. These are Islamic manners. Rasulullah sallallahu says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه None of you has total iman. Unless and until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. In the midst of this persecution, in the midst of this torment, Imam Ahmad wanted some water. But he sacrificed it because the rest of his brothers in the prison were not going to have water. So he didn't want it either. A great lesson for us to learn today of how sacrifice must be for each other. Of how we have to dig down deep into our pockets to spend for the sake of Allah. To spend for others. If we have something and others don't have it, then perhaps we have to pull back from having those things until everybody else can also have it. Imam Ahmad, he says, a few days after this incident, my uncle, Ishaq, he visit, visited me in prison. And he said to me, that look, why don't you just give up? Why don't you just give in? And just say what they want you to say. Because they wanted them to say that the Qur'an was created. So he said, why don't you just go ahead and give in? And we know who you are. We know that what you stand for. But just why don't you just go ahead and give in? Look, all your peers, all the other scholars, they, they have given in. So why don't you just go ahead and give in and, and stop this nonsense? Because after all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهِ وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, look, whoever disbelieves, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if they disbelieve after they've had iman, his anger is upon those people. Except those people who've been forced to do something, but yet their hearts are content with believing in Allah. So his uncle was using this part of the ayah. This ayah is in Surah An-Nahl. So he was, he was using this part of the ayah that look, the one who is forced and as long as in their hearts they're confident of Allah, then it's okay. It's not a big deal. Why do you have to make such a big deal about this? Just go ahead and give in and, 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 and you know, stop all this stuff. Imam Ahmad, 
he came with the response of a believer. He said, وَكَيْفَ تَصْنَعُونَ بِحَدِيثِ خُبَّاب بِنِ الْأَرَفِ what, you, what are you all going to tell me about the hadith of this sahabi, Khubbab? When he said, when he quoted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who said that those people who came before you, some of them were sawed in half with a saw. ثُمَّ لَا يَصُدُّهُ ذَلِكْ عَن دينه. And even that did not stop them from their practice of Islam. Even if they were sawed in half, they didn't give up on their Islam. So his uncle, he said, okay. And he gave up on Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad then began talking to himself. And he began saying that, look, it's being in prison doesn't bother me. Because for me, whether I live at home or whether I, whether I live in this jail cell, it's the same thing. And I don't fear that they're going to kill me with the sword. That doesn't bother me. But what does bother me a little is being whipped at the stake. I'm afraid that I may not be able to be patient. Akhafu Allah asbir. I'm afraid I may not be patient enough to go through that punishment. So one of the other Muslims who was there, who had been in prison for robbery and so on, and, and, for, and for doing other wrong things, and who himself had been whipped at least 20,000 times, this Muslim, he overheard Imam Ahmad talking to himself, and he said, Ya Aba, La alayka Ya Aba Abdullah. Abu, oh, Abu Abdullah talked to Imam Ahmad. He said, You don't have to worry about anything. Ma huwa illa sultan. It's only two strikes with the whip. And after that, whatever happens, you know, thumma la tadri, ayna yaqa'u al baqi. Then after that, you have no idea, you know, where the rest of the whips are going to hit. You don't feel anything. So Imam Ahmad says, Faka'annahu surri anni. It's as if he consoled me totally. And now I had no fear in my heart and my mind at all. Imam Ahmad says, After this, they came to me one day. And it was the 17th of Ramadan, he says. On the 17th of Ramadan, the orders came from the new Khalifa, Mu'tasim, to take me to his palace. But on the way, they stopped at this, the palace of the governor of Baghdad at that time whose name was Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. He was also the, the, the chief of police. So I was taken to his place. And I, as I entered, he says, I almost fell over because of the heavy chains that were on me. And what they would do in the cell that they put me in, every day, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, the police chief, he would send two scholars to argue with me, back and forth about the creation of the Qur'an and so on. And he says every day, for three or four days this happened. For three days he says this happened. That he would send these two scholars and they would argue and they would leave dumbfounded. By the time they left, they didn't know, you know, they could not answer my arguments that I had presented. And Imam Ahmad would always prevail. He said, but each day that I prevailed, they put another set of chains on me. So in four days, I had four sets of chains on me. And they became very heavy. So Imam Ahmad, he says one, one day they came and they began talking to me. And one of them, he said, look, how can you say that, how can you say that the Qur'an is, are the words of Allah? كَيْفَ تَقُولُ أَنَّ الْقُرْآنَ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ You know, how, how, how can you say that the Qur'an is the words of Allah? Because there's nothing like Allah. وَاللَّهُ لَا يُشْبِهُهُ شَيْءٍ وَالْبَشَرُ يَتَكَلَّمُونَ And the, the fact is that human beings, they, they speak. So if human beings speak, and nothing is like Allah, so then the Qur'an are really not the words of Allah. So Imam Ahmad, he says, فَسَأَلْتُهُ هَلِ الْبَشَرُ يَعْلَمُونَ He said, I asked him that, do people, do they have knowledge? So the scholar, he said, yes. Now, So he said, okay, how can that be? How, if, if, if human beings have knowledge and nothing is supposed to be like Allah, that means that Allah does not have knowledge. If nothing is supposed to be like Allah and human beings have knowledge, that means that Allah does not have knowledge. Unless you think that Allah created knowledge. So they said, 
the, the scholar said, yes, Allah created knowledge. Ilmullahi makhluq. Allah's knowledge is created. So, Imam Ahmad, he said, لَقَدْ كَفَرْتْ You've, you've just said something that is kufr. You've committed kufr. So, one of the guards who was there, he said, you know, هَذَا رَسُولُ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ This man that you're talking to, he's telling Imam Ahmad to be careful. And look, this man you're talking to, he's a messenger of the leader of the believers, the, the Khalifa, meaning. So, Imam Ahmad, he said, إِنَّهُ زَعَمَا أَنَّ عِلْمَ اللَّهِ مَخْلُوق This person is claiming that the knowledge of Allah is created. And he's committed kufr. So, when he said this, the guard himself was amazed at how the scholar had made such a statement. And he began looking at him as, you know, as if this, the scholar was crazy. So Imam Ahmad then began saying out really loud, مَنْ قَالَ Whoever says, that the words, uh, that Qur'an is not the word of Allah and is created, that person is a kafir. And whoever says that the knowledge of Allah is created, they are, they are a kafir. And whoever says that the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are created, they are also, they've also committed kufr. So, the scholars and this guard, they gave up on Imam Ahmad. He says, on the fourth night they took me, on the fourth night they took me to another place. And this time, I, end, I, I came on to Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, the police chief himself. And when the police chief met me, Imam Ahmad says, he said, Ya Ahmad, innaha wallahi nafsuk. He said, I swear by Allah that now the matter is getting really serious. That now, it's your soul. You're going to be killed. وَإِنَّهُ halaf And the, the Khalifa has sworn by Allah that he's not going to kill you with the sword. But he's going to whip you and whip you and whip you. And he's going to put you in a place where you will never see the sun again. Until you give in and you recognize that, uh, and you say what he wants you to say. So Imam Ahmad, he smiled. Because these things did not faze him. Because after all, he was a believer. And he knew the attitude of the oppressor. He knew the attitude of the dictator. He knew the attitude of the despot. You know, that attitude that either you're with us or you're not. Either you agree with us or you will be part of the debris. That attitude he knew very well. And so Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, he thought maybe let him take a jab at Imam Ahmad. And, he's, and he said, let's see if he, maybe I can convince him. So he said to Imam Ahmad, he says, Ya Ahmad, Alam yaqul Allah Azza wa Jal, O oh, Ahmad, didn't Allah in the Qur'an say, Inna ja'alnahu Qur'anan Arabiyya? Didn't Allah in the Qur'an say that we have put this as an Arabic Qur'an? So, Imam Ahmad said, Naam. So, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, he said, Afa yakunu maj'oolan illa makhluqan? That, is it possible that anything that Allah has put, that it is not created? In other words, if Allah is saying, using the word ja'ala, that is, uh, instead of saying put, it means to create. So the point he was trying to make is that the Qur'an is created. So Imam Ahmad, you know, he was, I mean, because of being an ocean of knowledge, his answer was on the tip of his tongue. Imam Ahmad said, أَلَمْ يَقُلِ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ you know, this is an uh, ayah from Surah Al-Fil. He says, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, and He put them, you know, the, the people of Abraha, you know, the, that He put them as empty stocks that were eaten up totally? So He said, yeah, He said that. So Imam Ahmad said, فَهَلْ خَلَقَهُمْ مَرَّةً أُخْرَى Did Allah create them again? You know, in order to be uh, dried up eaten stocks? The point was that the word ja'ala does not mean create. And this is what Imam Ahmad was trying to disprove to him. And so when he said this, this Ishaq ibn Ibrahim was totally silent. And he told the other guards, he says, bih. Take him to the Khalifa. Take him to the Khalifa. Brothers and sisters, again, these are profiles of courage. That how one single man stood up to an entire system. He was a man 
who have the attitude that I am a Muslim and I don't walk alone. I fear no one except the one above the throne. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد اللهم صل وسلم على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين brothers and sisters you know الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم says شر ما في رجل the worst characteristics that a person can have is he says شح شح هالع وَجُبْنٌ خَالِعٌ The worst characteristics that a person can have in their character are this impatient greed that just, I have to have it now. I've got to have it now. This moment, I've got to have it. I've got to have it. That's, that's a very bad trait in a Muslim. And the second thing is an unfettered cowardice, unrestrained cowardice. In other words, you're afraid of everything. You're afraid of this, you're afraid of that, you're always, you're always nervous, you're always tense, you're afraid of everything. Those are the two worst qualities any human being can have. And this is why a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-jubn. Oh Allah, I seek your protection from being a coward. From being a coward. So now Imam Ahmad, he is now taken to the palace of Mu'tasim. So, he says as he enters, now the four sets of chains were on him. And he was very tired. And he almost fell over again on his face. But he was able to maintain his balance. He says that when I entered, they, they took me to this one room. And as I entered, it was during the day. And there was nothing in the room. Nothing at all in the room. Not even a particle of dust. It was just me and my chains. It was the door and the floor and the roof and the four walls. That's all it was in that, in that room. And they closed the door shut on me. And they left me in my chains. And right outside the door they posted a guard. So nobody could come in, nobody could go out. He says then time passed and it was night time. And there was no light in my cell. It was total dark, pitch dark. Nothing at all in my cell. No light. He says, but I realized it was the middle of the night. And I had to pray. I had to do my wudu. So I began fumbling around and in, in, the, in my cell, and I began extending my hands this way and that way and to see if there was any pitcher of water. But I remembered that when I came into the room, there was not a single thing in, the, in, in this jail cell. And I, as I was reaching around, reaching here and there, suddenly I was shocked and I was surprised that my hand came across a pitcher of water. From nowhere, this pitcher of water came. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who exert themselves in our ways, we will guide them to our paths. We will give them. وَلَئِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Be grateful to Allah. If you're grateful to Allah, I will give you more. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ تَنْصُرُ اللَّهَ يَنْصُرْكُمْ وَيُثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَكُمْ O you who believe, if you support the cause of Allah, Allah will support you and will make your foothold steady and firm. Imam Ahmed found this picture of water. He says, I, I did my wudu and I began praying in the chains. What were you praying, Imam Ahmed? Did you miss a fard or something? No. What, what, what was it, sunnah? In, in that condition? You want to pray a sunnah? Don't you know Allah may forgive you? Forget about those sunnah? You, you want to pray tahajjud? In this condition? With all those set of chains upon yourself? Don't you have more important things to worry about? Like yourself, 
Don't you need to get depressed first? Don't you need to get sad first? Don't you need to get down on yourself first? No. You see, Imam Muhammad was thinking of Allah first. And he wasn't even thinking of himself. For him, all of this was for the pleasure of Allah. It didn't matter what, what trials he was going through. So, Imam Ahmed, he says he prayed, and he prayed all night long. He said the next morning they came, and they got me, and they took me to the court of, of Mu'tasim. He says Mu'tasim came in to, 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 his, uh, to his court there, and there was a chair that was set up for him, and he came, and he sat on his chair, and he took off his shoes, and he put one leg over the other, and he told the guards, Uhduru Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Bring Ahmad ibn Hanbal in front of me. So they brought, he said they brought me in front of him. And when I went in front of him, I said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I gave the greetings to, said the salams to the Amir al Mu'mineen. And so the Amir al Mu'mineen, this Mu'tasim, he ignored him and he said, Ya Ahmad, takallam wa la takhaf. Oh Ahmad, Go ahead and speak and don't you be afraid of anything. Don't fear anything. Now listen to the response of Ahmed. This is the response, the courage, the power, the strength of the believer. And the presence of mind that the believer has, that Iman brings into the heart of the believer. Imam Ahmed said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Wallahi ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. لَقَدْ دَخَلْتُ عَلَيْكَ وَمَا فِي قَلْبِ مِثْقَالُ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ فَزَعَ He said, I swear by Allah, O leader of the believers, when I came into your presence, I swear that not even an Adam's weight or a mustard or a seed's weight of fear or terror was in my heart. In other words, he was not afraid in any way, shape, or form. So Mu'tasim said, Utnu minni, come, come close to me, come close to me. And Imam Ahmed was struggling with his chains, he could hardly walk, and so he made his way over after a little while to Mu'tasim. And Mu'tasim said, Ijlis, sit down. So as he began to sit down, he could hardly sit down, he could hardly bend, because he, he, the chains were so, they were, they, they were just so limiting and so restricting, he could hardly move. But finally, after some struggle, he sat down. And so, Imam Ahmad said, تَأْذَنْدِي بِالْكَلَامِ Would you let me speak? Can I go ahead first? So, Mu'tasim said, تَكَلَّمْ Go ahead and speak. So, Imam Ahmad says to him, إِلَى مَا دَعَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ What did... The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked us to come to. What did he invite us to? So Mu'tasim said, Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah wa Muhammadur Rasulullah. He invited us to, bearing, to bear witness that there is no one who deserves to be worshipped but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So Imam Ahmad said, وَأَنَا أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنَّا مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهُ And I bear witness that there is no one who deserves to be worshipped but Allah and, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So Mu'tasim was silent. Because Mu'tasim knew what Imam Ahmad is pointing to. Because Mu'tasim knew that Imam Ahmad, what he was saying is that we're supposed to believe in Allah and His Prophet. There's nothing about the creation of the Qur'an. So what, what are you all talking about? So... Mu'tasim was silent. So Imam Ahmad, he said, let me say one more thing. And he was very intelligent. So Imam Ahmad said, حَدَّثَنَا Yahya ibn Sa'id عَنْ شُعْبَةً He said that Yahya ibn Sa'id told us on the authority of Shu'ba, قَالْ حَدَّثَنِي Abu Hamza. He said that Abu Hamza told me, قَالْ And Abu Hamza said, سَمِعْتُ ibn Abbas That I heard Ibn Abbas say the following, relate the following hadith. Now, Imam Ahmad was very smart and he said about Ibn Abbas because Ibn Abbas was one of the forefathers of Mu'tasim. 
Because Mu'tasim was from the Abbasi Caliphate. And he was from the, the descendants of Ibn Abbas. So Imam Ahmad was very careful, very intelligent to use the name of Ibn Abbas. And to use a hadith that had Ibn Abbas's name in it. Because he knew that the minute he heard the name of Ibn Abbas, Mu'tasim would perk up his ears and would listen even more carefully. So he said, I heard this hadith from Ibn Abbas who said that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he had this incident. Lama ja'a wafdu Abdi Qais when the delegation of Abdu Qais came to Prophet Muhammad and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amarahum bil imani billah he told them to have faith in Allah and to have iman in Allah. So فَقَالَ أَتَدْرُونَ مَا الْإِيمَانُ بِاللَّهِ That do you all know, he's, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said to the people, the, the, this delegation that came to learn about Islam, he said that do you all know what it means to have faith and have iman in Allah? And so the people said, Allah wa rasuluhu a'lam, Allah and his Prophet know best. At that point, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that al-imanu billah, believing in Allah, means shahadat wa la ilaha illallah. That bearing witness that there is no one who deserves to be worshipped but Allah, number one. Number two, when the Muhammad is Rasulullah, and Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah. Number three, wa al salah and establishing the salah. Number four, wa ita'u zakah and to give the zakah. And number five, wa sawmu ramadan. And number six, wa an tu'tu al khums min al maghrib. And that you know, from the money that is collected at the time of jihad, that you give a fifth of it to the Khalifa. Now, Imam Ahmad was very smart in the way that he said this hadith. First of all, he used the hadith from Ibn Abbas because there was a relative of Mu'tasim. Then, secondly, he related a hadith in which there was nothing mentioned about the creation of the Qur'an. And that this is all of what Islam is supposed to be. And Mu'tasim realized that. And so Mu'tasim was frustrated and he turns to Imam Ahmad and he says, لَوْلَا وَجَدْتُكَ فِي يَدِ رَجُلٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ had I not found you in the hands of the man before me, talking about the Khalifa Ma'mun before me, ma ta'arradtu lak, I would have never bothered you, I would have never turned my attention towards you. And then he turned to the, uh, uh, the son of uh, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, who was the police chief, and he said, Alam amurk, that didn't I order you, an al mihna, that didn't I order you to stop all this persecution of all these scholars and all that? So the son of Imam, Imam Ahmed who was there, Salih, he said, I said to myself, فَقُلْتُ فِي نَفْسِي اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ That this is, you know, Allah is great. You know, إِنَّ هَذَا لَفَرَجًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ That this, you know, as if Mu'tasim is now convinced that he's going to let all the Muslims go. I said, Allahu Akbar. So, <sighs> Mu'tasim, he began thinking a little bit. And he said, okay, well before that happens, let me ask Imam Ahmed himself. And he said to Imam Ahmed, كيف تقول في القرآن? What do you have to say about the Qur'an? Now, Imam Ahmed is on the verge of being let go. He's on the verge of finishing all this persecution. And he asked him this one final question. What do you have to say about the Qur'an? And so Imam Ahmed says, كلام الله قديم غير مخلوق. He said to him, that I believe that the Qur'an are the words of Allah. Eternal. They always existed. And the fact is that they are not created. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an says very clearly, and He mentioned an ayah from Surah At-Tawbah, where He said that and if any of the pagans, they come to you, seeking protection, give them protection, give them refuge, until they hear the words of Allah. Hatta yasma'a kalam Allah. Mu'tasim was confused. All the scholars that he had all around, they could not answer Imam Ahmad. And he turned to them looking in their faces that answer him. But they couldn't say anything. So Mu'tasim said, Alaka hujjatun hadi? That do you have another proof besides this proof? So Imam Ahmad said, Naam ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Yeah, there are many other proofs of, of, of leader of the believers. For example, قال الله عز وجل الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان الرحمن, the most merciful who taught the Quran and created the human being. In other words, what you sign to say that look, Allah didn't say He created the Quran and He created the human being. No, He says He taught the Quran and He created the human being. So 
he says, do you have another proof? He said, yes. Yasin wal Quran al Hakim. Take a look at Surah Yasin. Allah says Yasin and the wise Quran. He doesn't say wal Quran al Makhluq and the created Quran. So Mu'tasim was just totally flabbergasted. Just totally frustrated. So he turned to his people and he said, Ihbisu, take him back to the prison. And he began talking to his people, all his scholars who were near him and so on, about how they should respond to Imam Ahmad. And with that, the first day in the presence of Mu'tasim came to an end. Brothers and sisters, if you've not learned anything today, except the fact that how courage helps the believer, then that is enough. Brothers and sisters, during trials, the believer has to stand up strong. It's not the time to hide. This is the time to come out and become more active. This is the time to sacrifice. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts these challenges in our lives. We are an ummah who've crossed many problems, many catastrophes. We've overcome many disasters. We are an ummah that has overcome catastrophes that are much greater than any other set of humanity. The Mongols, the, 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 what happened to us in Spain, was, what happened to us in slavery, and what happened to us in this century, and what's happening now in Palestine, and Iraq, and Kashmir, and the rest of the world, how we've overcome tremendous obstacles. This is an ummah that's a resilient ummah. It's your choice. Do you want to be a part of success? Do you want to be a part of triumph? Or do you want to watch from the sidelines? Remember, the attitude of the people of the past was, I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim and I do not walk alone. I fear no one except the one above the throne. Brothers and sisters, let us all make the dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. And, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all brave. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب وأقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين سبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لما تقولون ما لا تفعلون كبر مقتا عند الله أن تقولوا ما لا تفعلون إن الله يحب الذين يقاتلون في سبيله صفا كأنهم بنيان مرصوص وإذ قال موسى لقومه يا قوم لم تؤذونني وقد تعلمون أني رسول الله إليكم فلما زاغوا أزاغ الله قلوبهم والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين 
وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاةِ وَمُبَشِّرًا ومبشرا برسول يأتي من بعد اسمه أحمد فلما جاءهم بالبينات قالوا هذا سحر مبين ومن أظلم ممن افترى على الله الكذب وهو يدعى إلى الإسلام والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بأفواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره الكافرون هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين يا أيها الذين آمنوا هل أدلكم على تجارة تنجيكم من عذاب أليم تؤمنون بالله ورسوله وتجاهدون في سبيل الله بأموالكم وأنفسكم ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون يغفر لكم ذنوبكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ومساكن طيبة في جنات عدن ذلك الفوز العظيم وأخرى تحبونها نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا أنصار الله كونوا أنصار الله كما قال عيسى بن مريم للحواريين من أنصار إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله فآمن الطائفة من بني إسرائيل وكفر الطائفة فأيدنا الذين آمنوا على عدو فأصبحوا ظاهرين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده 
الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما Oh you who believe fear Allah and say that which is right because you will straighten out your affairs and forgive your sins surely whoever obeys Allah and his prophet they have achieved a great victory great success brothers and sisters we were traveling with Imam Ahmed and the last time we were with Imam Ahmed he had just completed his first day of interrogation at the hands of the Khalifa Mu'tasim and there were many scholars who had tried to stump Imam Ahmed, but no one was able to stump him. Nobody was able to overwhelm his arguments or to overcome his arguments. He was one man, one scholar against an army of scholars. But of course, as is usually the case, in the face of truth, in the face of truth, Falsehood crumbles. Falsehood totally crumbles. And that's what happened. Their argument, all those scholars who were there, who were backing the Khalifa for something that was wrong, their argument was that, look, we know a lot. We're scholars. We have a lot of Islamic knowledge. We know what we're doing. And we reason everything with our minds. And... Every argument that we have makes a lot of sense, although it may not be totally based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Because you can't just depend on the Qur'an and the Sunnah, you also have to rely on your mind. This was the attitude of the scholars and the people who were in the wrong. Imam Ahmad's position and the position of every Muslim, which he represented, the position of truth, was that, look, I'm ready to buy any argument you have to put forth. But just give me some proof from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that proves your argument. There's no problem with using the mind and the reason of the mind and the rationale of the mind as long as it does not contradict or conflict with revelation. As long as it does not contradict or conflict with the Qur'an and the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This position of Imam Ahmed befuddled and just completely bothered the other scholars and Mu'tasim. And obviously Mu'tasim was very frustrated. That's why he called an abrupt end to the first day of interrogation. On the second day of interrogation, after Fajr, they assembled and there were huge crowds outside the palace of Mu'tasim, and Mu'tasim rolled in, he, he came in, and then he said, Hatu Ahmad ibn Hanbal, give me Ahmad ibn Hanbal, where is Ahmad ibn Hanbal? In a few moments, Ahmad ibn Hanbal was brought in with chains all over his body, he could hardly walk, and he was brought in and put in front of Mu'tasim. Mu'tasim asked Imam Ahmad, he said, كيف كنت يا أحمد في محبسك البارحة 
how was your night in the jail cell last night? How did you do last night? Imam Ahmed was not one to complain. He was not one to be negative. And he said, Bi khair, walhamdulillah, I was fine, and alhamdulillah, everything was okay. Illa anni ra'aytu fi mahbasika amran ajiban. Except that last night, in the jail cell, I saw something really weird, something really strange. So Mu'tasim said, Wa ma ra'ayta ya Ahmed? What, what did you see, O oh Ahmed? So Imam Ahmed went on to explain, he said, look, you know, I got up in the middle of the night, and I did my wudu. I got up in the middle of the night, and I did my wudu. And then I went ahead and I started the salah. The salat al-layl, the tahajjud. So, I began with the first rak'ah and I said, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And then after that, I read, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falaq. And then he said, I, I went down, I did the ruku' and the sajda and so on. And I came up for the second rak'ah and I uh, said, you know, read Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And then after that, I, I read Surah Al-Nas, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas. And then I sat down, I did my tashahud and uh, I, I said the salams. Then I got back up to pray the second set of two rak'ahs. When I got up, I said, Allahu Akbar, in the second set. And I said, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And then I, be, I tried to read, Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. I just could not read it. For some reason, I couldn't read, Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. And so I tried, and I tried to read any other ayah, or any other surah from the Quran, I couldn't read it. He said, I finished the salah, in the second rak'ah, after Surah Al-Fatiha, I couldn't read any other surah. I mean, I couldn't read any other surah or any other ayah from the Qur'an. I just couldn't read it. He says, so I finished the second set. And I was sitting there, and, and then it looks like he dozed off. And I, I saw, in, in a dream, I saw that I was looking at the corner of the prison, in, of my jail cell. And I extended my eyes towards the corner of the jail cell. And there I saw that the Qur'an, that the Qur'an was just laying down. And the Qur'an was dead. And what I did was I got up and I washed the Qur'an. And I put the coffin on the Qur'an. And I said the prayer, the janazah prayer on the Qur'an and then I buried it. Mu'tasim, he was surprised to hear a scholar of this degree saying something like this? He said, وَيْلُكَ يَا أَحْمَدْ وَالْقُرْآنِ يَمُوتْ And he said that, whoa, whoa, woe be to you, oh, Ahmed. You know, as if to say, what are you saying? Oh, Ahmed. You know, does the Qur'an die? So Ahmed, he said, هَكَذَا تَقُولُ أَنْتَ This is what you're saying. إِنَّهُ مَخْلُوق You say that the Qur'an is created. وَكُلُّ مَخْلُوقٍ يَمُوتْ and everything that is created dies. So Mu'tasim immediately understood the intelligent argument of Imam Ahmed. And he said, Qahrana Ahmed, Qahrana Ahmed, Qahrana Ahmed. You know, Ahmed has just, you know, just completely overwhelmed us. Has just completely taken over. Has just completely, just completely put all our arguments aside. Has stumped us totally. So he turned to the other scholars who were there. And he, he was looking at them to say something on his behalf. And he said, Nadiru, you know, argue with him, say something, kallimu, say something. So nobody got up. And then he said, Ya Abdul Rahman ibn Ishaq. He was one of the scholars of the Mu'tazila. He said, get up and say something, kallimu, say something to him. On my behalf, say something. So Abdul Rahman ibn Ishaq, he got up and he said, Ya Ahmed, ma taqulu fil Qur'an. Oh Ahmed, what do you have to say about the Qur'an? He started to, you know, the whole argument all over. So Imam Ahmed, he said very intelligently, he said, Ya Abdul Rahman ibn Ishaq, ma taqulu fi ilm Allah. He said, what do you have to say about the knowledge of Allah? Now, Abdul Rahman immediately knew what Imam Ahmed meant. And because the, the problem that Imam Ahmed put Abdul Rahman ibn Ishaq in is that if he said that the knowledge of Allah is created, then that would be kufr. He would be a kafir. 
And if he was to say that the knowledge of Allah is an attribute of Allah, just like so then Imam Ahmad would automatically say, well, just like Allah's speech is an attribute of Allah, Allah sees and Allah hears, and of course that's different than human beings, and then he would have to agree with Imam Ahmad. So he was in a very difficult position. Either he had to declare his kufr, or he had to agree with Imam Ahmad. There was no middle position. So, Abdurrahman ibn Ishaq, knowing his predicament, he, was, he started thinking, and he kept quiet. You see, his ego and his arrogance and his false pride came in the way. And he could not respond. He could not admit that he was wrong. He could not apologize. And what happened was, that without saying a word, he went back to his seat and he sat down. He did not answer Imam Ahmad. And so one after another scholar got up and started to, started to say something to Imam Ahmad. But one after the other, Imam Ahmad shot down their proofs. One after the other. The entire army of scholars and experts and consultants and, and, uh, uh, and cabinet ministers, everybody tried to uh, uh, prove Imam Ahmad wrong. But nobody could do anything. Imam Ahmad was armed with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So finally, after all of them had quieted down, Imam Ahmad turned to the Khalifa, Mu'tasim, and he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, O leader of the believers, أَعْطُونِي شَيْئًا مِّن كِتَابِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أَوْ سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَقُولُ بِهِ He said, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, leader of the believers, Give me something, some proof from the Qur'an, from the book of Allah, or from the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, from the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Give me something from the Qur'an or the sunnah. Because we can't just go based on intellectual proofs. Especially when they're not grounded in the Qur'an and the sunnah. So, at that point, one of the cabinet ministers who was one of the leaders, one of the leading scholars, his name was uh, Ahmad ibn Abi Duad. He got up and he was livid with anger. Very angry. And he said to Imam Ahmad, Ya Ahmad, Anta ma tatakallam bi illa bi kitab Allahi wa sunnati Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that, Oh Ahmad, you don't say anything except from the book of Allah and the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the only thing you use? As if to say that you don't use your mind? Intellectual proofs have no substantiation in your way of thinking? So Imam Ahmad smiled and looked into his face as if to say, of course not. We just look at the Qur'an and the Sunnah and that's it. So Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, he got very upset. And he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said, oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, Wallahi, innahu dalun mudillun mubtadi'. This Ahmed is somebody who's misguided and he's misguiding other people and he's an innovator. And then he turned to all the people there, the, all the people who were there watching and he said to, uh, to the, to Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, he said, وَهَاُولَاءِ قُضَاتُكْ وَالْفُقَهَاءِ فَسَلْهُمْ These are all your judges, these are all your knowledgeable people, all the faqees. So go ahead and ask them, what do they think? So for a moment there was a quiet, there was a hush over the entire audience. And then, then they stood up and they all said, هَذَا مُضِلٌ هَذَا ضَالٌ مُضِلٌ مُمُبْتَدِعٌ This person is misguided and he's misguiding others and he's an innovator. Imam Ahmad, he said, بِمَا ضَلَلْ How am I wrong? How have I strayed from the right guidance? One after the other, they tried to prove things to Imam Ahmad. Every proof that they would bring, Imam Ahmad would destroy it, would deflate their arguments totally. Imam Ahmad says that, as I began to respond in such speed to their proofs, it became as if my voice was louder than their voices, all of them put together. Nobody could stump Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad, in his chains, After the persecution, not eating, not drinking, despite all of that, he held strong for the Qur'an. 
for the Qur'an. One of the scholars got up and he said, doesn't Allah say in the Qur'an, Allahu khaliku kulli shay? Doesn't Allah say in the Qur'an that Allah created everything? Imam Ahmad said yes. He said, well, Qur'an is shay, then Al-Qur'an is makhluq. And therefore, the Mu'tazili scholar he said, the Qur'an is a, a thing, so therefore the Qur'an is created. Imam Ahmad smiled. And he said, أَلَيْسَ كَذَلِكَ يَقُولُ فِي الْقُرْآنِ تُدَمِّرُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بِأَمْرِ رَبِّهَا Doesn't Allah also say in the Qur'an that uh, He's talking about the Thamud, that how the Thamud, when they were destroyed, how the winds came. And the winds destroyed everything. Doesn't Allah say that the, they destroyed everything? So, so the, the Mu'tazili scholars they said, Yeah? Bala? So, he said, Wa hal taraka shay? Imam Ahmad said, did, did those winds, did they leave anything? The Mu'tazili scholar said, No. No. So then Imam Ahmad said, Even, كَيْفَ يَقُولُ بَعْدَهَا فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ How did Allah say after that? Right after that part, Allah said, to complete the ayah, how did Allah say, so they got up the next morning, and, and they, uh, nothing was seen of them except their dwellings. In other words, everything was destroyed but their dwellings. So the Mu'tazili scholars, they, they were all stumped again. Again, Imam Ahmad stumped him from an, a, a, from an incredible citation from the Qur'an. The point was that, yes, Allah created everything. But only those things that are allowed to be created. There are some things that are not creatable. Like Allah's vision, like Allah's sight, Allah's hearing, Allah's knowledge, Allah's, Allah's speech. Those things are uncreated. So therefore... Just like certain things are allowed to be destroyed, and certain things are not, it's up to Allah. So again, He stumped them. Again, the entire day was a very, very frustrating day. And as with the first day, Mu'tasim abruptly called an end to the second day as well, as Dhuhr approached. He asked everybody, Qumu. Get up, and everybody left. With the exception of two people. Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, asked Imam Ahmad, and another one, one of the leading scholars of the Mu'tazila, his name was Abdul Rahman ibn Ishaq, to stay back. He wanted to have a private meeting. Mu'tasim wanted to have a private meeting with uh, Imam Ahmad, and with Abdul Rahman ibn Ishaq. So, after everybody had left, and they were meeting privately, Mu'tasim came and sat next to Imam Ahmad. And he said, هَلْ تَعْرِفُ صَالِحًا الرَّشِيدِ Do you know this man named Salih al-Rashidi? So Imam Ahmad said, نعم, I know him, yes. So Mu'tasim said, كَانَ مُؤَدِّبِي He used to be my teacher. When I was young, he used to be my teacher. وَكَانَ and he was sitting one day, he was sitting in the same place that you're sitting right now, O oh, Ahmed. So one day as he was sitting in the same place that you're sitting, he he's talking about his teacher now, his teacher, the one he's supposed to really respect. He says, So one day he was sitting and he began talking about the Quran. فَخَالَفَنِي. And he had a difference of opinion with me. فَأَمَرْتُ بِهِ فَسُحِبْ وَوُطِئْ So I ordered that he be dragged on his face and I stomped on his head. Mu'tasim was saying this about his teacher. As if to tell Imam Ahmed, that look, if I did this to my teacher, I'm going to do a lot more to you if you don't watch it. If you don't agree with what I'm going to say. So Imam Ahmed, after hearing this, he simply looked into his face, undaunted, fearless, you know, as if, yeah, okay, so what? what what's the big deal? So he stomped on his face, and so you dragged him, so, so what? And Mu'tasim saw that it had no effect on Imam Ahmed. 
And he said, فأنت ما؟ ما عرفتك؟ ما كنت تأتينا؟ He said that, who are you? Because I, I never knew you. You, you. you didn't used to come to us, you know, like all the other scholars used to come to our court, the court of the Khalifa, but you never came. At that point, Abdul Rahman ibn Ishaq, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, أعرفه أنا منذ ثلاثين سنة. I know him for the last 30 years. Imam Ahmed, I know him for the last 30 years. فَيَرَى طَاعَتَكْ وَالْحَجَّ وَالْجِهَادْ معك. And so he, he believes, this scholar, he believes that you should listen to the leader. You should listen to the Amir al-Mu'mineen, you should obey him, and to do hajj and to struggle with him if he calls out for, for a struggle, you know, to go out and fight in the way of Allah, that he believes in that also. So, Mu'tasim was a little bit at ease because he saw that Imam Ahmed was not out to, you know, have a struggle against Mu'tasim. And he was not going to fight against Mu'tasim, so he was at a little ease and he was okay with Imam Ahmed. And so he said to Imam Ahmed, Look, I would, I would be so happy. I would be okay with Imam Ahmed. If he was to be by my side, and because he was impressed, he was deeply affected with the arguments of Imam Ahmed and how, how intelligent he was and how wise he was. So he said that I would be so happy if Imam Ahmed is with me and I, I could use him if he's by my side to refute any arguments that anybody brings to me. But if he would only, if he would only agree with just part of anything that I've said, just a little bit of anything that I've said, if he agrees with me, then I swear by Allah that I will free him with my own hands and I will go to him as a student to learn from him. Mu'tasim wants to become a student of Imam Ahmed now. On one condition. If he just says a little bit, just a small itsy bitsy thing that agrees with Mu'tasim. After saying this, he looked into Imam Ahmed's eyes and he said, Ma taquli ya Ahmed? Ahmed, what, what do you have to say? So, again, you know what Imam Ahmed said? A'tuni shay'an min kitab Allahi azza wa jal aw sunnati rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Give me something from the book of Allah or the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mu'tasim got very upset. He was red in the face. He saw that he could not break Imam Ahmad. He could not soften him in any way. And so, he ordered the guards to come and get Imam Ahmad. And Imam Ahmad on the second day was returned back to his jail cell in Baghdad. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد اللهم صل وسلم على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين brothers and sisters you may think or some people may think that why are we mentioning this story what does it have to do with our times and we're talking about whether the Quran was created or not created and so on Brothers and sisters, it is through these examples that we gain our inspiration on how to act today. You know, there's some great lessons that come out from this struggle that Imam Ahmed waged to stand up and stand up strong for the case of truth. You see, a lot of us may think that who cares whether the Quran was created or was not created, what, what's the big deal? it may appear like a small issue. But see, Imam Ahmed stood up for a small issue. Because the Qur'an was very important. It was the basis of all truth. Today, if Imam Ahmed fought so hard for a small issue like that, today we have a much bigger problem. And the problem is that a lot of us say that we believe in the Qur'an, but we're not ready to take it as the constitution for our life, as a program of instruction for our lives. How many of us know how to read the Qur'an properly? 
Allah forbid if the imams who lead the salah here, if they were not here, are the rest of us ready to come and lead the salah? What if, what if tomorrow, Allah forbid, if tomorrow some of us are taken to prison, are there enough brothers here to be able to lead the salah? To read the Qur'an properly? At that time, Imam Ahmad was struggling just for, let's say, a small issue, as it may appear to us. But today, the issue is much bigger when it comes to the Qur'an. Most of us don't know the Qur'an. Most of us don't have much of the Qur'an memorized. We haven't even read it. We don't know its meanings. We can't even read it properly. Imagine how Imam Ahmad would have felt about that. Why is it that the Qur'an Institute, for example, or the various Qur'an programs in the various masjids, or the Qur'an Institute here, why is it that only very few people come to the classes to learn the Qur'an? Why aren't the classes packed like now, like a Jum'ah? Why? Every time you read the Qur'an, one letter of the Qur'an, you get ten rewards. So the Qur'an... It's a very important thing. The second thing is that the basis of all truth, second big lesson from the struggle of Imam Ahmad, the basis of all truth is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Take it or leave it. The minute you declare the shahada, you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, what you're saying is, I believe in the Qur'an and I believe in the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If there is no Qur'an and no Sunnah, then there's no truth. There's no guidance, there's no piety, there's no righteousness, there's no good. The third lesson. Everything that we do as a Muslim, we're asked to come with our proofs. قُلْ حَاتُ بُرْحَانَكُمْ Bring forward your proofs. If you're going to do something, whatever you do, in Islam, whatever you do, there has to be something from the Qur'an or the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that upholds the way that you believe. So now, if you're going to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, give me some proof. Where does it say in the Qur'an that you can have a boyfriend? Where does it say in the Sunnah that you can have a girlfriend? And I'm not, I'm not talking about just the kids, I'm talking about the grown-ups, uh, the grown-ups as well. Because we learn how to justify it by checking out a sister or checking out a brother. When we really haven't left our jahili practice of dating. Many of us, we, we hit on sisters, we, we go with the excuse of going and trying to tell her about Islam. And we're already married. And we have no intention of getting married to the sister. But we just want to play around with the sister. And the sister may get attached. And then afterwards we leave, we drop the sister. Like a ton of bricks. Is that a good impression for a new Muslimah? Show me in the Qur'an or the Sunnah where the proof exists that we can do something like that. A lot of Muslims, they're into complaining. Show me where, it is, where in the Qur'an it says that we can just go ahead and complain and complain and complain. A lot of people like to be very negative, very pessimistic. Where does it say in the Qur'an? Give me the proof from the Qur'an or the Sunnah that we can be negative, we can be complaining. If you want to take off your hijab, give me an ayah from the Qur'an that says, Oh, you who believe, take off the hijab. Give me something from the sunnah where Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, Oh, women of Islam, take off the hijab. If you're living in America. Give me some proof. Imam Ahmad was asking the same thing. Atuni shay'an min kitab Allah wa sunnati Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Give me something from the book of Allah and the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa you're going to go ahead and backbite and say bad things about your brothers and to other communities and to other people? Give me some proof from the Qur'an that justifies that. Give me some proof from the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam that justifies that. You don't want to learn the Qur'an? Give me some proof from the Qur'an or the sunnah that you should not learn the Qur'an. You don't want to learn Arabic? Give me some proof from the Qur'an or the Sunnah. You don't want to be part of the community? Give me some proof. You don't want to give in the way of Allah? Give me some proof from the Qur'an or the Sunnah of the Rasul You want to cheat on your taxes? Give me some proof from the Qur'an and the Sunnah that a Muslim should be like that. You want to buy a house on interest? 
give me some proof from the Quran and the Sunnah. Imam Ahmad was asking for the proof. And if there was no proof, we cannot do it. We cannot do it. The last thing. There's a lot of temptation. A lot of temptation to do the wrong thing. You see, Mu'tasim tried to tempt Imam Ahmad. He said that, look, just agree on a little itsy bitsy thing, just say this, and, and we'll be buddies. Everything will be okay. Today, the same type of pressure is being applied to the Muslim. Just compromise a little. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَدُّوا لَوْ تُدْهِنُوا فَيُدْهِنُونَ They want you to compromise so that they can also compromise. They want you to go easy so they can also go easy. So just be like them a little bit. And then they, they, then they fool you by thinking that everything will be okay. But it's not. Everything will never be okay until you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Because there will be a struggle between truth and falsehood. Between the forces of justice and injustice. Between the forces of justice and tyranny. There will always be a struggle. It started with Iblis and Adam alayhi salam. It continued to the time of Musa and the Fir'aun. And it continued at the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab. And it exists today with the Muslims and the, and the pharaohs of today. So, brothers and sisters, there are tremendous lessons that come out from this. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He lets us think about these examples and give us, give us the time to reflect upon the message from the life of Imam Ahmad. May Allah be pleased with him. ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب وقم الصلاة الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل هو الله أحد 
الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا All you who believe fear Allah and say that which is right that which is proper. Brothers and sisters, last time when we were with Imam Ahmad, Rahimahullah, we were with him when the Khalifa Mu'atasim had just given an offer to him and had given him an offer that look, if he would just compromise a little bit, if he would just agree with him a little bit, that he would free him and Imam Ahmad would walk a free man. But Imam Ahmad was a mountain of faith. He was a man of principle. And his humble request at that time to the Khalifa was, أَعْطُونِي شَيْئًا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أَوْ سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ just give me something from the book of Allah Azza wa Jal or the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just don't give me any intellectual reasoning and especially when it doesn't have any basis in the Quran and the sunnah. That's not going to really matter much. So the Khalifa he gave up and he sent him back to prison. Imam Ahmad says that when I went back that day, on the second day after Dhuhr, there, there were two scholars who came to try to debate with me. And they, they were not able to convince me of anything. And then they left. Then he says, in the evening, The Prime Minister, or the, he had the position of the Prime Minister of, of Baghdad at that time. His name was Ahmed ibn Abi Duad. He said, he came to me and he said, the Khalifa, Amir al muminin wants to know what you've decided. As if the Khalifa didn't know already. But he thought that after all of this, Imam Ahmed would soften up. Because remember, Imam Ahmed still had all those chains upon him. And he was, he was feeling very weak. So he thought Imam Ahmad would now begin to soften a little. So he sent Ahmad ibn Abi Dua to find out what does he think now? What has he decided? Again, Imam Ahmad responded with a conviction of a believer. And as stable as a mountain. He said, أَعْطُونِي شَيْئًا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أَوْ سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَقُولُ بِهِ Give me something from the book of Allah Azza wa Jal or the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad or the sunnah of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم so I can then talk about it. Ahmad ibn Abi Duad, he said, you know, after you left today, 
after he sent you back after Dhuhr, he gave me a list of about seven people who are going to be executed. And then he erased your name off that list of people who are going to be executed. And instead, he put your name on the list of the people who are going to be whipped by the whip. And so it's not the sword that he's going to use for you. He's going to use the whip. Again, he thought that this would soften Imam Ahmad. But Imam Ahmad was strong in his faith. Nothing could tempt him. Nothing could change him because he knew his aqidah well. Nothing would shake Imam Ahmad. So, Imam Ahmad again repeated for the third time, أَعْطُونِي شَيْئًا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أَوْ سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلْمِ Give me something from the book of Allah Azza wa Jal or the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Give me something that would prove it. Again, Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad was frustrated and he also left. Imam Ahmad says on the next day, the third day, I felt in my heart that something's going to happen today. Something's definitely going to happen. And so I asked the guards to go in the morning of the third day, I asked them to go get a string because I, I was afraid that if I would be whipped and if I fell unconscious, then my, my pants would fall. And so I asked them to get a string so I could tie my pants you know, tighter so that my pants wouldn't fall if I lost consciousness. So he says, I did that. And then he said, they took me to the palace. And today when I came to the palace, I saw everything changed. And definitely it was a different day today. He said, I saw people who had weapons. I saw people who had swords. I saw people you know, who, who had whips in their hands. I saw scores of troops all around the palace, outside and inside. Everywhere I saw troops. And outside I saw that there's a huge amount of people who gathered. But before anything happened, before the interrogation began, before the hearings began, he said, the Khalifa sent two messengers to me. And these two messengers, they came up to me and they said, you know, get a grip of yourself. You know, get, you know, understand what's going on. The Khalifa is worried about you. Just like he would be worried about his son. They were trying to tell him that, you know, change your mind before it's too late. Go a little easy. Imam Ahmed again. His famous statement. أَعْطُونِي شَيْئًا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أو سنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Give me something from the book of Allah عز وجل or the sunnah of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. One of the people who was there as an eyewitness on that day, he was a government worker. He says his name was Ahmed ibn al Faraj. He says that I was going into work on that day and I noticed that there were a lot of people and they had all closed down their shops and they had grabbed their weapons. And so, he says, I, I, I began wondering, and certainly today, Baghdad or Baghdad, Baghdad was a different place. The world in Baghdad had totally changed today. And everyone was concerned about Imam Ahmed. People were talking about Imam Ahmed. And people were ready to give up their lives and to sacrifice whatever they had to sacrifice just so Imam Ahmed could live. So he, he says that, I saw that the Khalifa also noticed there's a lot of people gathered everywhere, and there were crowds forming. And so he asked his troops, and there were armed troops, to be around the palace and so on. The people were just amazed to see the courage of this great Imam. And he said, I went up to some of the people in the crowd just to ask them to make sure why they had gathered. So he said, I, when I asked them why they had all gathered, they said, today Imam Ahmad is going to be tested because of the Qur'an. Today Imam Ahmad is going to be tested because of the Qur'an. So he said, I went to one of the guards at the palace and I asked them to let me in so I can go right you know, to the front row there to see exactly what happened. He says, I, I got to the front row, and there, just as I got there, the, the, the hearing began with Imam Ahmed. 
And Imam Ahmad had not arrived, but the Khalifa had arrived. And the Khalifa said real loud, where is this man who says that Allah talks, that Allah speaks? Where is this man? And where is this man who has said that Allah, you know, Allah has a, a tongue and Allah has, has a, a mouth to speak with? Of course, Imam Ahmad never said anything of the kind. All, all Imam Ahmad said was, Allah speaks. He didn't say that he needs a tongue like human beings and he needs a, a mouth like human beings. Because there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is something that the Khalifa himself added. So, soon Imam Ahmad was brought in. And Imam Ahmad, when he was brought in, he was brought in with his jail shirt. It was a different shirt that, he was, that they had put on him. And they had a hood on his head. It may sound familiar to some of the things going on today. So they put a hood on his head. And so, he came in and he didn't see the people. But he heard everything that was going around and how the people were whispering. And, and he felt, you know, that definitely today was a very serious day. And so they brought him and they put him in front of the Khalifa. And Imam, Imam Ahmad put one hand over the other. And he said, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. You know, there's no, there's no movement nor strength save through Allah. And Imam Ahmad, after saying this, he began listening. And in the meanwhile, the, the crowds outside, they were gathering more and more. In the meanwhile, the crowds outside were gathering more and more. People were wondering what's going on. Imam Ahmad says the dialogue began. And Mu'tasim began asking him, so you are Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And Imam Ahmad said, I am Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal. So he said, you're the one who, I, I understand you're the one who's saying that Allah talks and Allah speaks and the Quran is not created. Where did you get all of this? So Imam Ahmad said, I got it from the book of Allah. He said, where did you read it in the book of Allah? So Imam Ahmad said, there are plenty of places. He said, like what? So he told him again, وَلَكِنْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ مِنِّي He quoted a verse from the Qur'an from Surah Al-Sajda. He said, وَلَكِنْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ مِنِّي لَأَمْلَأَنَّ جَهَنَّمَ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ That my word is going to come true. The speech of Allah is going to come true. When, when he said that I'm going to fill the hellfire with jinn and mankind. So Imam Ahmad said, this is what Allah says. Do you think there's somebody other than Allah who has said this? Mu'tasim again was totally dumbfounded. So he turned to his scholars who were there, like Bishr al-Marisi and Ibn al-Zayyat and Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, and he asked them, Nadhru, you know, debate him, say something to him. But all the other scholars who were there, they had all had their turns to debate Imam Ahmad, and they were all frustrated. And so they, their only reaction now, because they were so frustrated, they couldn't defeat Imam Ahmad because of his incredible proofs on the Qur'an and the Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they could not defeat him. They could not overcome his arguments. So, they only had one reaction. And they said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, uqtul. Oh, leader of the believers, kill him. Kill him. Mu'tasim got up immediately and he went right in front of Imam Ahmad who had the hood on him, and he didn't know what was going to happen. And Mu'tasim reared back with his hand, all the way back, and he brought his hand to slap Imam Ahmad on his face. And he slapped him so hard, that Imam Ahmad fell on the ground, unconscious. He did not move, Imam Ahmad. When this happened, some of the troops who were there, they were from Khurasan, they were the friends of Hanbal, the grandfather of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. They immediately got up and they left. Mu'tasim was surprised at what happened. Mu'tasim was now afraid that now because of Imam Ahmad, there's going to be a revolution among his ranks. That's all, some of his people had already begun to leave. And so immediately he told the, the guards who were there, he said, he told them, you know, bring some water and sprinkle him with water, put water on him, you know, to bring him back into consciousness. So they took off the hood and they, they were putting water on him. And they put a, a, many buckets of water on him. Finally, Imam Ahmad regained consciousness. When he regained consciousness, he saw that his uncle, 
Ishaq ibn Hanbal, the uncle of Imam Ahmad, was in front of him, and, and in front of his uncle was the Khalifa, Mu'tasim. And his uncle was begging him to let Imam Ahmad go. You see, his uncle also had succumbed. His uncle had also begun to say that the Qur'an was created. He, he, had, he had yielded, he had capitulated to, 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 the, to the Khalifa. And he had given in. But he was pleading on behalf of Imam Ahmad. So Imam Ahmad, he was you know, on the ground. He looked up at his uncle and he, and he began talking to his uncle and ignored the Khalifa, totally. Boldly ignored the Khalifa. And he said, you know, the one who threw all this water on me, it looks like he's a little bit upset. I mean, look at the presence of mind that Imam Ahmad had. He said, it looks like he's a little bit upset. And he was purposely saying this to anger the Khalifa. You know, as if to say that, look, we've been talking like human beings, just are debating with each other, and now you're going to hit me, you know, just because of the arguments from the Qur'an and the Sunnah? Is, is that something that's right? Is that something that's just? So the Khalifa, he got very upset. And he said, you, you don't think that I know what you're trying to do? Meaning that you're trying to, you know, talk down to me? So, at that point, some of the other people who were there, they said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Uqtulhu, hatta nastariha min. Oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, go ahead and kill him, so that we'll, you know, we'll be, we will be relieved of his presence. We'll get rid of him forever. So, Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, he said, I made a promise to Allah that I'm not going to kill him by the sword. And I'm not going to tell anybody to kill him by the sword. Instead, I'm going to do something else. So they, the, the other scholars who were there, they said, the other scholars who were there, they said, okay, use the whip. So he said, I swear that I'm going to use this whip and I'm not going to stop whipping him until he says that the Qur'an is created. Until he says what I'm saying. And so the punishment began. Imam Ahmad says that they dragged me on my face and they took me between these two huge planks of wood and they tied me up. And then they called these big huge men who were going to whip me. And one of them brought forward a whip to Mu'tasim to show him what the whip looked like. Mu'tasim didn't like the whips. He asked for another stronger, bigger whip. And so that whip was brought in front of him. Then he, Mu'tasim ordered the first one who's going to strike Imam Ahmad. And he's all tied up. Now, he said that, he said to him, come, come close to me. So that man, he came close to Mu'tasim. And he said, Awjir. Hit him as hard as you can and, and, and give him as much pain as you can give him. So the man, and there was a whole line of these strikers or these whippers, you could say. There's a whole huge line of them. 20, 30 of them. So the first one went up, and he whipped Imam Ahmed as hard as he could. Twice. Mu'tasim says, stop. Then he asked, then he told him to step aside, and he asked the second one to come up and then whip him. Because you see, Mu'tasim did not want any of those whippers to get tired. So they, he wanted to give him his full strength when he whipped Imam Ahmed. So the first one came, and then the second one came, and the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, and all the entire line of these people, they came and they whipped Imam Ahmed. The people were watching. There were people outside. Mu'tasim was getting angrier by the minute. And the scholars, they were also getting very mad. Because Imam Ahmad still was holding strong. One of the men, he yelled out, that look, the Khalifa is standing in front of you, your Amir al-Mu'mineen is standing in front of you. You should obey him. Mu'tasim, he came down from his seat. And he came to Imam Ahmad, tied between the two planks of wood. And he began, he took out his sword. And from the other end of the sword, the handle of the sword, he picked it up and he started beating Imam Ahmad with the metal handle of the sword. Imam Ahmad was hurting all over. He had already been whipped 
more than 60 times. And here the Khalifa is now hitting him with the hard handle of his sword. Imam Ahmed, going through all of this, the people saw the police chief of Baghdad. He came forward, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, and he told Imam Ahmed that, look, just say what he's saying. Just say what he's saying. He's the Khalifa. O obey him. Imam Ahmed still did not listen. He was holding strong for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the cabinet ministers of the Khalifa, he yelled out, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, cut off his neck right now. But again, Mu'tasim didn't. Mu'tasim now frustrated, he came back to his chair and he sat on his chair. And now he summoned the strongest of the whippers. He hadn't, he hadn't whipped Imam Ahmed yet. It was a big man and he was the best of the whippers. So he called him forward, the man came forward and he said, how many whips, how many times do you have to whip Imam Ahmed till he dies? How many whips will it take to, to kill him? So the man said, oh, five or ten, or at the most fifteen or twenty, but not more than that. And so the man was given the order by Mu'tasim. Mu'tasim said, go ahead, kill him. And hit him as hard as you can. And the faster you finish this business, the better for all of us. So the man started whipping Imam Ahmed. After about the 14th or the 15th time, finally, the pure blood of Imam Ahmed gushed forth from his shoulders and fell to the ground. As the blood flowed to the ground, the whipper kept on hitting Imam Ahmed. The people were aghast to see the patience of this great scholar, to stay on the haq, to stay on the truth. They admired his courage, rahimahullah. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. To such a degree, that the police chief of Baghdad at that time, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, innahu insanun ta'if al-jism. He said, Oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, look, this is just a man. He's weak in his body. Because Imam Ahmad was bearing all this whipping despite his weak body. He said, this is just a weak man. Let him go. So the Amir al-Mu'mineen, Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, he said, Laqad sami'ta qawli. You heard what I said. I swore that I'm not going to let him go and I'm not going to stop whipping him until he says what I'm saying. So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, the police chief of Baghdad, he came up with a plan. He asked the Khalifa, he said, can I just have permission to talk to him just for a second? So the Khalifa said yes. And so Ishaq ibn Ibrahim went to Imam Ahmed. And Imam Ahmed at this point was delirious. He did not know what was going on around him because he was be beaten so silly. And his body was on fire from the whips. He was aching all over. So, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, he went to Imam Ahmad and he began whispering in his ears and he said, Ya Aba Abdullah. It was one of the names of Imam Ahmad was Abu Abdullah. So he said, Ya Aba Abdullah, O oh Abu Abdullah. Laqad taba Amir al Mu'mineen an maqalatih. Wa huwa yakul. La ilaha illallah. The Amir al Mu'mineen, he whispered in his ears. Nobody else could hear except Imam Ahmad. He said that Amir al Mu'mineen has gone back on what he was saying about the fact that the Quran was created. He was lying to Imam Ahmad. He said that the Amir al Mu'mineen has, has repented from what he has, has been saying. And what he is saying is La ilaha illallah. Imam Ahmad, he only heard the last part. And so Imam Ahmad responded and said, with a lot of exhaustion in his voice, he said, Kalimatul Ikhlas. Wa ana aqul, la ilaha illallah. He said, this is, this is the statement of sincerity, of devotion to Allah. And I also say, 
لا إله إلا الله. When Isaac ibn Ibrahim, the police chief of Baghdad, heard this, he yelled out immediately. He said, يا أمير المؤمنين لقد قال كما تقول O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, look, he said exactly what you're saying. So Mu'tasim thought that, oh, Imam Ahmed had now gone easy, and he had finally relented. So everyone who had stood up and was watching this entire thing it, within the palace, they all, be, you know, the, uh, the people's voices got really loud because people couldn't believe that Imam Ahmed had now relented and had said, has, had said what the Khalifa wanted him to say. The Khalifa couldn't believe it. And so, so as, as people began, as the voices got louder and louder outside, the, the masses of the Muslims who had crowded out outside, they were also very amazed. And they began, they thought something had happened to Imam Ahmed. And so they, they also began to make a lot of noise outside. So the Khalifa, he heard the noise outside, so he sent some of his messengers to, to his balconies and to see what's going, you know, to look down and see what's going on outside. And so the messengers, they came back to Mu'tasim. And they said, look, there's pandemonium outside. The people are swearing that they're going to kill you. And, I'm, and we're warning you that you, I, we feel that you should send Imam Ahmed in front of them so the people calm down. So the Khalifa Mu'tasim, he, he became very afraid. And, he's, and he told the people, Al-Bisu, you know, put his clothes back on and take him out there in front of the people. So... They took him out in front of the people, and the people calmed down. And the people, they began, they began saying, مَا قُلْتَ يَا عَبَى عَبْدِ اللَّهِ حَتَّى نَقُولُ Oh Abu Abdullah, talk to Imam Ahmed, oh Imam Ahmed, what did you say so we can say the same thing? Imam Ahmed waited till the whole crowd outside, there were thousands of people outside. He waited till everybody quieted down. And he said, ما عسى أن أقول. What else should I say? He said, all of you reporters who are here, pay attention. And all of you masses of Muslims, bear witness to what I'm about to say. أن القرآن كلام الله غير مخلوق منه بدأ وإليه يعود. He said that the Quran is the word of Allah, is the speech of Allah. And it's not created, and it started from him, and it returned to him. Needless to say, the people were happy that Imam Ahmed had still not budged. He was as strong as ever. But the Khalifa was livid. He was very upset. So he ordered that Imam Ahmed be brought back in. And they brought Imam Ahmed back in. And they closed the doors. And the Khalifa ordered that they start whipping and they tie him up and they start whipping him. And, and, and so, so the guards, they, before they even tied him up, they started punching him and beating him and hitting him with sticks and kicking him. And Imam Ahmed fell unconscious again because of the intense amount of beating. So they threw water on him to bring him back. And so when he came to again, when he regained his consciousness, after beating him for, for many hours, they decided that they were finished for the day. And so the Khalifa ordered that they bring him this really sweet date drink. It was a sweet drink that was, you know, full of dates and so on. It was, it was a delicacy at that time. So they brought, Imam Ahmed was on the ground, panting and hurting and bleeding. And they bring this date drink in front of Imam Ahmed. And you know what Imam Ahmed says? Wallahi la uftir, inni sa'im. He says, I swear by Allah, I'm not going to break my fast, I'm fasting. Imam Ahmad, you were fasting? Wasn't it hot? Wasn't it difficult? Didn't you have a headache? Oh, you had more than a headache, right? But you're still fasting? You didn't make any excuses. Oh, Allah will forgive. Allah is merciful. Allah is compassionate. No, you didn't make any of those excuses. You're still fasting. After all the beatings and being unconscious and your body bleeding and being whipped and whipped and whipped and whipped, you're still fasting. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulihi al-kareem 
وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد اللهم صل وسلم على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters Mu'tasim later on that night the Khalifa sent a doctor to the jail cell of Imam Ahmed and the doctor says Wallahi laqad ra'ayt man duriba alf sawt He said that I swear by Allah that I've seen people that who were whipped at least a thousand times. He said that I never saw anybody beaten so badly as this. And the doctor, he began to treat the wounds of Imam Ahmed. And he says that Imam Ahmed was beaten so bad, he was beaten on the back and the front, everywhere his body was on fire. There was no place on his body except that it had blood coming from it. He said that he was beaten so badly that I saw some of the flesh of Imam Ahmed hanging off of him. And, and I told Imam Ahmed that look, I'm going to have to cut off some of this flesh. Otherwise, it's, it's, this is dead meat. And if, it, if you leave it where it is, it's going to infect the rest, of the, the rest of your body and the other muscles in your body. So Imam Ahmed said, yeah, go ahead. Do what you have to do. He says the doctor, he brought his hot iron and he brought his knife. You see, in those days, they didn't have anesthesia. They couldn't numb the thing. It was all live. So he put his hot scoldering iron on the flesh of Imam Ahmed and he began to burn it and he began to cut it with his knife. And he says, I couldn't believe it. When I looked at the face of Imam Ahmed, he was smiling all the time saying, Alhamdulillah. 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 Imam Ahmad says that these marks, they stayed on him the rest of his life. The son of Imam Ahmad, he says that I heard my dad saying while he was going through all of this, he was saying to himself, لَقَدْ أَعْطَيْتُ الْمَجْهُودَ مِن نَفْسِهِ he said that I gave it all I had for the sake of Allah. I gave up everything for the sake of Allah. Everything, my body, everything I gave it for the sake of Allah. وَمَعَ ذَلِكَ فَإِنِّي أَرْجُو أَنْ أَخْرُجَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا كِفَافًا لَا عَلَيَّ وَلَا ثِيهَا He said that even after all of this persecution and after all of what I had gone through, I just hope and I pray to Allah that when I depart this world, when I leave this world, that I leave such that my score is all even, that there's nothing against me and nothing for me, just that my, 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 my slate is all even, it's all clean. That's all I care about. This is the great mountain of Iman who's worried about himself. How should we think about our situations today, those of us who've taken our Islam for granted? Those of us who think we already have a foot in paradise. Imam Ahmad was very patient. He was very clement. He was very forgiving. In this state, he spent 28 to 30 months of being beaten and, and being abused like this. But you know, one day, Mu'tasim, he called out to the uncle of Imam Ahmad and said, Go ahead, take him. Take him, I freed him. لَقَدْ سَلَّمْتُهُ إِلَيْكُمْ I'm going to go ahead and free him to you. But there's some conditions. There's some conditions. The first thing is that he's going to be under house arrest. And there are going to be guards all around him. He's not allowed to talk to anybody. He's not allowed to have any halaqas with anybody. He's not allowed to teach anybody. Imam Ahmed accepted these conditions. And he was under house arrest. How mean can a person be to a scholar? Whatever form of meanness there was, it was foisted upon, upon Imam Ahmed. But you know, Imam Ahmed had a deep sense of care for human beings. He loved them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't take anything personal. He was clement, he was forgiving, he was, he was merciful, he was compassionate. He, he, he overlooked things. It was during his time when he was under house arrest that Mu'tasim got the call from the woman that still rings out all over the world today. That woman who was harassing Ammuriyah she was harassed by some of the non-Muslims. 
And so she called out really loud, Ya wa Mu'atasima, oh Mu'atasim, help me. And Mu'atasim, when he heard, when, when some people brought the message to Mu'atasim, he sent an army of 100,000 soldiers to rescue that woman, to Ammuriya. When he was getting ready to send that army, Imam Ahmad made a dua. Made a dua for Mu'atasim, who had tortured him and persecuted him, made a dua for him that Allahumma ansurhu. Oh Allah, help him towards victory. Oh Allah, help him to triumph. And when Mu'atasim went, and when they came back and they said to Imam Ahmad that the Muslim army was successful, Imam Ahmad, you know what he said? Huwa fi hillim min darbi. He said that I've forgiven him for all his hitting and all his torture and persecution of me. I've forgiven him. You see, Imam Ahmad did not take things personally. Although he was whipped, and persecuted and tortured. And you heard the story. But he forgave all of that. But what he did not forgive was the bid'ah, was the innovation that Mu'atasim stood for. That's what he didn't forgive. Brothers and sisters, Imam Ahmad says he kept on thinking about this ayah, wal ya'fu wal yasfahu. Let them forgive and let them overlook things. Ala tuhibbuna an yaghfir Allahu lakum. Don't you want, don't you wish that Allah forgive you if you forgive? He said, I kept on thinking about this. And he said, I kept on thinking about another ayah. فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ That whoever forgives and, and reconciles and, and makes up with people, then, uh, then their reward is with Allah. He said, I kept on thinking about this and I decided to forgive everyone who had tortured me, who had persecuted me, who had whipped me, who had hit me, who had punched me, who had kicked me. I decided to forgive all of them. Brothers and sisters, today, shall we learn from Imam Ahmad and his courage, courage to forgive. Courage to be merciful. Should our husbands and wives learn from this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَن تَعْفُوا أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَنْصَبُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ And that you forgive each other, it is closer to taqwa. And don't forget the goodness between you, the husbands and the wives. Should we also learn from Imam Ahmad that despite the situation he was in, and the torture that he had gone through, he had the courage to forgive. Because there was a bigger goal, and that was to please Allah. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab al nar. Rabbana la tazig kulubana ba'da id hadaytana wa hablana milla dunka rahma inna kanta al wahab. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء Faith Publication Presents Muslim Youth Under the Shade of the Throne by Sheikh Safi Khan An inspiring series of lectures dedicated to our youth. These motivational talks address young Muslim adults instilling Islamic values and preparing them for their spot under the shade of Allah's throne. Available at your local Islamic bookstore to learn more, visit us at www.faithpublications.org or call us at 1-866-FAITH-12.